All right, and we are live. Thank you, everyone, for uh, coming to watch this video. It's going to be pretty fun, I think. Um, as you know, I'm very interested in St. Thomas's uh, first way. And so whenever I saw this video from carnesdes.org, um, I wanted to go ahead and respond to it. Um, I'm here with, uh, well, how do you want me to identify you? You can call me, sorry, you can call me Econ if you want. That's a reference to my Twitter handle. <laughs> right. And you also have the uh, Atheist Takes. Yes. Uh, yes. I also run Atheist Takes on there. Um, it's a good time. So you can, you can even call me Atheist Takes if you want, but that's probably a much longer. So Econ's probably better for you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So uh, we're just going to go ahead and go through this video. Um, it's about 20 something minutes long, so this is probably be a, a longer video, but, um, uh, yeah, we'll just go through it. Welcome back to Carnades.org. Today we're going to be continuing with our series, St. Thomas Aquinas's Five Ways for Proving the Existence of God. In this video, we're going to be looking at objections to St. Thomas Aquinas's first way, the unmoved mover. Now, before we get into objection to this argument, it's important to note two things about this argument that will form our first two objections. First, the purpose of this argument is not to prove the Christian God of the Bible. Aquinas had another set of arguments with that goal. This means two things. First, any objections that this argument is insufficient to prove that God fall flat, since they're attacking a straw man. So uh, I wanted to respond to this a little bit. Um, he he kind of goes on and on about this, but um, I think this is technically, I understand why he's saying this, and it's because atheists are going to be like, well, you know, why isn't, this doesn't prove that, that God, is, the Christian God exists in the sense of uh, like a, a blip, bit, sort of like a character, a character inside of a story or um, you know, something that's intelligent and uh, all, all powerful and that doesn't want you to, uh, you know, do, do sexual things that they want to do. That's more what they're thinking. However, uh, historically, the definition of God has uh, been a little bit different from this. Uh, St. Thomas Aquinas said that the name he who is is most properly applied to God, which signifies simply existence itself. So when St. Thomas is saying in, at the end of this argument for motion that God is, that the purely actual actualizer, uh, the unmoved move, mover is God, it's because his view of what uh, the Christian God is is different from like what a typical atheist is thinking. It just is like simply existence itself. So uh, while it's true that uh, he's addressing the, he doesn't prove all of the divine attributes and he does that later, um, I do still feel like he's proving that uh, God exists um, and even could be said to be the Christian God. What do you yeah, think I about I, this? Yeah, I was just going to add, I, I think that's kind of a weird thing for him to say, so... It's not that Aquinas doesn't use this argument to then prove God. It's just that the text itself that he uses, like if you just look only at the text of, say, the first way, he doesn't really spend much time on the divine attributes. But in the Summa, Summa Theologica, he spends a while then establishing the divine attributes, and he does the same in his Against the Heathen. So I, I don't really get I, I get what he's going for, but it's just kind of misleading, I think. Well, to be fair as well, he does say that he does kind of make arguments for this in the That's future. True. That's uh, true. Yeah, and I get his point, but I just wanted to be clear that like, it's not like right. this isn't God. It is God. Um, just from as long as you have uh, the historical sort of definition of God and not the sort of uh, magic man in the sky or whatever kind of idea, or even just yep. like one that requires that all of the divine attributes to be proven right okay let's continue 
if that's your concern, you should rather take issue with that other set of arguments, which attempt to go from this amorphous, poorly defined thing that's like a god to the specific Christian one. Second, it means that anyone that claims that this argument proves God in any way beyond some nondescript pure actuality is simply incorrect. And you can completely object to them and that claim, because that claim is just wrong. It's not what Aquinas was attempting to do with this argument. It's not that the argument failed at doing that, it's that the argument was never meant to do that in the first place. So, this argument is insufficient by design, it's insufficient to prove anything but some of the most basic properties of such an entity. Those properties could just as easily be attributed to a grand unified theory of physics or something, or a theory of all physics, as they could to a conscious being, barring other arguments. Now, Aquinas is going to make other arguments that take it from that to something else. But with this argument as it stands now, God, as most people conceive it, has not been shown and has not been proven, even if you accept all the premises and you think it's valid. Yeah, so um, just to summarize, I mean, yeah, I think that technically he's incorrect in the sense that this does prove God. It just doesn't prove like he said, maybe you could say most people, as most people conceive it, because most people don't like have a technical theological definition of God. Um, however, you know, whenever, uh, you know, whenever I bring this up, a lot of atheists will say, oh, yeah, but if you ask like the normal person, they're going to say that um, God is like some kind of superhuman character or something like that. And, you know, my response is that like, yeah, OK, but if you ask if you ask people on the street like what how, how do you define evolution how does evolution work they're going to give you some kind of crazy false uh, idea of uh, what evolution is as well so typically when we're talking about these sort of technical um, high level concepts we're not going to appeal to what like most laymen think we're going to appeal to like what the experts think yeah, I was just gonna um, just that wanted to agree with that because it's it's really weird to say well because the majority of people believe this therefore your argument doesn't establish what you wanted to it's just kind of weird um, and if you actually you know spend time investigating the scriptures and using more philosophy you'll find that the classical theist model is vastly superior. Yep. All right. Next. All right. This brings us to the second caveat which is that Aquinas is relying on Aristotle's physics to make this argument. Aristotle, as wonderful as he was at many things, his natural philosophy has not aged well. This makes complete sense for Aquinas to be doing this, since more explanatory theories of the way physics works did not exist yet, and the good job of the scholastics was to take the Bible and Aristotle and make them make sense together. However, Aristotle's physics are just outdated. The rules of actuality and potentiality are entrenched in the idea that all things have a purpose, and the unmoved mover is inferred from the claim that the celestial bodies are eternal and move perfectly. That's <clears> the <throat> reason that this argument works, and we have to kind of brush over some of those details right now, because there are things that we don't believe anymore. Few, if any, people believe that there are crystalline spheres in the sky that rotate around the Earth and hold on them little lights that are the stars. Now, if you believe that, maybe this theory of science isn't that outdated, but for most people, it's going to be outdated. Most people today think that gravity moves the planets and stars, and that stars and planets can die and aren't perfect. Most people also think that not all objects have a purpose. Or if they do, they probably only do so because they already believe in a god and a grand design, which is going to beg the question against the atheist for this argument. So while for its time, this was a great and influential argument, if you believe in modern science, the argument just falls flat. So, yeah, a lot of problems here. <laughs> uh, I mean, you can go and read uh, St. Thomas Aquinas' argument for motion yourself and the Summa Theologiae 
Um, surprise, I mean, like, it doesn't mention crystalline spheres at all. So I I don't really know where he's getting this from. I mean, maybe it's it maybe Aristotle mentions it inside of the physics. I don't really remember. I've read it before. I don't remember him saying that, but it, it's possible that he said that. But but the yeah. po- but the point is this is not a key part of the arguments. You don't need it. St. Thomas Aquinas didn't reference it. Um and and you don't you, you can make the argument for motion without the crystalline spheres or whatever. Um, one more point. <clears throat> With respect to, uh, he mentioned purposes. I mean, this is kind of also irrelevant because the argument for motion is not based on purpose. This is more of the fifth way, the teleological argument. Uh, but something to note is that when we're talking about purposes within inside of uh scholastic philosophy all that means is that you know things basically have a tendency to produce particular things and so like eyes tend to produce sight rather than shooting out lasers and you know things like that it doesn't mean that there's necessarily like it doesn't require the assumption that there's some kind of designer behind it who's purposely causing things to happen and so uh yeah i think he he uh misunderstood that point as well yeah i'm also not quite sure how gravity disproves the axe potency distinction i mean what he seems to be doing and this is a case of a lot of these people that respond especially to the first way is they in a sense use i guess you could say equivocal language with these terms um I mean, it's again, it's especially common in the first way where they'll look at the argument from, quote, motion, and so they think of motion in the same way as people think of motion nowadays. Whereas Aquinas, of course, is talking broadly, speaking of change. Um, yeah, and I agree with you. I I, have, I was going to add that the exact same thing. I have no clue where he got the notion of the, the necessity of, say, the crystalline entities for the validity of the first way. I, I, don't, I don't know where he's getting that. Um, and so I'd like to hear where he gets that see him actually defend some of this stuff because a lot of what he's had is honestly just a series of assertions about how aristotle's physics doesn't really work so yeah and you know um dr edward phaser points this out inside of uh his uh aquinas beginner's guide um that yeah i you, you know we wouldn't really accept these um principles of physics within uh aristotelian philosophy However, uh, these arguments can be abstracted. Like even if Aristotle right. happens to use uh, the crystalline spheres as uh, an example in, in his arguments, which I'm not sure if he does or not, um, that wouldn't prove the argument wrong because it's just an it's just an example, um, and right. you can use other examples. You can extract um, the general concept as Aquinas himself does from this uh, Aristotelian physics. Right. I mean, that's very much what you get with Aquinas is sometimes he will use this language where, I mean, yeah, it is outdated physics, but I don't think I've ever seen where I've seen, oh, well, this argument completely falls apart because he uses ancient physics. It's usually, yeah, just an abstraction from his argument to give an example of something. Yep. All right. Next uh, objection. So objection one, if someone claims that this argument proves anything more than the simple necessary force which determines motion, they are incorrect. Aquinas never meant this argument to be able to prove the Christian God, and it does not. Objection two, this argument relies on an archaic understanding of physics, which modern scientists reject. You can still hold on to Aristotle's physics over modern science if you want to, but there are quite a few things which would then become impossible to explain, like supernovas. According to Aristotle's physics that you need for this argument, the stars and everything in the heavens has to be perfect and moving perfectly and never stopping. Yeah, nobody's holding so, to that. <laughs> with those two out of the way as being the two biggest and probably most persuasive objections we're going to cover here, let's move on to objections to premise one. So premise one says change movement exists in the world. In effect, things go from potentiality to actuality. 
While following McTaggart's argument about the unreality of time, change in this way doesn't exist. There is no A series of time, no moving now. Objects are one way at one point in time and another way at another point in time. There's no important way in which they change from moment to moment. Objects are simply this way one at one point and another way the next. This is an objection to the idea that we have some kind of potentiality and actuality. According to this, there's no sense in which that's real. In fact, we just have a lot of actualities going on. And so since change and movement doesn't exist <coughs> in the world, we can deny this premise and be done with the argument. This is probably a radical view to take, but it's one way you can deny the argument, by saying change just doesn't exist. So, yeah, I, so you can do this, but I mean, from my perspective as a real, realist, it's just kind of absurd. I mean, we can see that things change and like any sort of arguments you're going to make is going to be based on change. You, you know, you got to move uh, from premise to conclusion. Uh, and, and, you know, that, that takes a process of reasoning, which takes time. And also, like, if you're going to be studying something in physics to support this, uh, that's going to presuppose that actually change is happening because you see... Uh, you know, you're going to see something uh, happen prior, then ha something happen after, and that's and based on how that change occurred, you're going to be uh, making an inference based on that change. And so it, it just seems like it's sort of undermining, self-undermining to do that. Also, um, I, technically, so it wouldn't be the argument for motion anymore, but technically you can... Uh, make this argument with you can point to like actuality and potentiality without change for example uh, um, the composition of parts um, the composition of parts includes uh, actuality and potentiality where the you know um, the unity of the part is actualized or the parts are you know are the parts are potentially unified and that's actualized by a unifier. Um, so that's one way in which you can have it inside of like a timeless state that the actuality potentiality uh, distinction. Yeah, I mean, there's also one of the things as well is that the act potency distinction is actually quite broad, um, just as you were saying. Another example, of course, is kind of analogous more sort of Thomas Aquinas's fourth way, wherein, you know, an instantiation of some concept or I guess you could say a universal stands in potency to that which it's exemplifying. So, you know, the purely actual is thus, you know, there are there basically are, is some concept of transcendence. Um, sorry. Um, but yeah, I just don't really get why he thinks that act potency absolutely falls apart if you remove um, the tense theory of time. And I, I mean, I have to research it more. You could totally correct me if I'm wrong on this one, but I'm not even. I'm not exactly wholly sure why it, why one would say that even, you know, that the tense theory of time entails that there's no possibility of change whatsoever. Um, I'm not really, I've never really followed the logic that B theory entails some kind of necessarily, like, like how do I say, a kind of determinism such that there's no other possible worlds. It's just kind of weird to me, um, but I could be wrong on that one. Yeah, interesting. I don't, I don't know enough about that to uh, comment on that. Yeah, yeah. If, if, if I'm wrong, like, I, I again, that's just a thought that I'm throwing out there. It's not absolutely integral to my argument here, but I don't really see why the fact that this world exists in this way um, and that there's no change um, in it, per se, because of the necessary existing things, like how time would be, four dimension, uh, would be the fourth dimension of the universe. I'm not sure why you can't say that there are other possible universes that this universe could have been some other way because that still is potency it's potency applied to the entire universe is the universe could be different uh, yeah and also i mean like so like what are they going to think they're going to think okay well there's not actually change in the world what happens is uh it's just like an illusion of change and so right. it's o only change is happening in a mind but then there's change right there so yeah. in our minds and so you can have the you can go forward with the argument so 
uh, yeah, I don't really see any reason or, or way to get around. Like, even if you deny that change exists out, does you know that change actually exists outside of our heads? I don't see any way of really getting around uh, change in our heads, and then we can make the argument for motion from that. Right. All right. Uh, so let's see what he says about Hume, the atheist's favorite philosopher. Continuing with that, we can go along with Hume. So Hume and the problem of causation. Causation is going to be necessary for Aristotle's idea of change and the movement from potentiality to actuality. We have to show that something is actualizing something else. Now, since causality is needed in this argument, we can't show that causality exists, at least if you will follow Hume. Or causality just doesn't exist, depending on your interpretation of it. For actuality and potentiality to work in this way, an actuality must cause something else to move from potentiality to actuality. Since we can only show that there is a constant conjunction between two events, not actual causation, we can't show that actualities actualize potentialities. So the whole system is going to fall apart. Okay, so I think this is actually coming out of uh, Hume's idea of causation as being um, where causes are prior to their effects. Um, because then, so basically he's just reducing everything to per accident causes. And it's just like, he's just like, okay, well, we can't really see uh, a direct um, cause, but... So the way I, I actually have a whole video on uh, the principle of causality and uh, the, how you prove it. And it's not so much, well, it, has, it is kind of seeing it. So like, l let me give an example that will probably help you to see um, the issue. So if you have a hole, for example, then the hole is going to depend on the parts for its existence. Which means the the whole uh, doesn't exist in and of itself, and so um, so this is sort of a an example we can see logically where uh, the there's going to be a cause of the parts. Why? Uh, sorry, the whole. Why? Because it doesn't exist in and of itself. Um, actually, maybe a better example would be something like okay. It's, something going from uh, hot to cold, or so from cold to hot. Uh, if you think about it, if it can go from cold to hot, it has to be within its own essence, and within what it is, it can be either cold or hot. So it's um, what it is, is sort of indifferent to the actuality of heat. And so this is sort of the reason why we think there has to be something that else that actualizes the heat inside of these objects because its own essence doesn't actualize the heat um, it's indifferent to the heat and so logically this actuality of heat has to come from something um, outside of the essence in order for it to be uh, you know different from something that is uh, not heated so so that's so that's more it's so it's more like um in, in virtue of being able to distinguish between essential and non-essential uh parts inside of a thing you can determine that there's a causation you don't have to like uh see a causal connection between uh two temporally distinct events i don't know if that was clear at all <laughs> No, I, I know what you mean. Um, basically, he's confusing uh, per se and per accidents causality. I mean, you just gave an instance of it. I think, I mean, also Hume, I, I believe, doesn't this come in some way from Hume's problem of induction? Because Hume's whole point is, well, you may observe causality in the world, but that doesn't mean causality is a true law. It's just those constant conjunctions. Um, I mean, y yeah, kind of. Yeah, if, I mean, if that is the case, like, if that's the case, I mean, there are a lot of problems with Hume's 
quote problem of, of induction. Uh, I think the most famous of which, or the best response, is just that it depends on Hume's fork, which is itself pretty much a self refuting idea, um, because his fork is basically that, you know, the the only, I guess you could say the only knowledge, so to speak, or, or the only knowable propositions are either relations of ideas or a, or matters of fact. So, either you know, it's saying, oh. There's a married or a bachelor is or all unmarried, which is just pretty much tautological, right? Or it's empirical statements. Um, like the problem is Hume's fork, like that proposition itself is not an empirical statement, nor is it a um, mere relation of ideas. So I, it's pretty self refuting, and that's the basis um, upon which he makes his problem of induction. Um, and so I don't have like way too much else to say there, except that. <laughs> Out of everybody to use to respond to Aquinas, I, Hume is just not really the best. I know he's the most popular, but I don't. I'm not really very convinced of this notion that causality is not real. And I think, you know, I, ironically, ironically telling people, you know, um, well, yeah, Aristotle's physics is outdated, with, and replacing that potentially with, yeah, causality is not real. That's a, <laughs> I, I don't know. That's just kind of weird. Yeah, no, that's. I mean, I, I think that. They're going to misunderstand it and and only apply it um, selectively because they're going to you know argue that science right. is still something that we can work with, and science it, you have to accept causality in order to do any sort of science. Um, right. And I, I think you're you're right that it's about um, induction because he's basically saying, well you know what we do is we see that. Uh, a lot of uh, it, event, this event tends to precede this event. And then we just assume that that means that there's sort of a causal connection just because a bunch of different, uh, a bunch of, you know, things were prior, or it, it happens to be together um, very often. But that's not, that's not the logical argument at all. Uh, it's, it's not the fact that, uh, you know, this thing tends to be prior to it. It's the fact that um, the object itself can change from cold to hot, and so within what it is, it has to. It it's indifferent to cold or heat, because if if what are, if what it was were contingent on being hot, like if if to be a uh, a rod of iron was to be a hot rod of iron then it could never be cold because as soon as it's cold it would stop being a rod of iron and so uh, you can see the distinction and understanding what the thing is the distinction between what's essential and what's not essential and then you can um, realize uh, the causal principle is or what makes it hot is going to be distinct from what the what the iron rod is and that that's sort of the logic of it it has nothing to do with like a constant conjunction of uh prior and after events right yeah i agree with that all right uh kind of doing this off the top of my head so sorry if it's a little confusing uh, but i, I if you want to hear more about this i i would encourage you to watch my video uh principle uh demonstrating the principle of causality or something like that. It, it's on my channel and uh, should uh, give a clearer idea of what I'm doing because it's more laid out. All right, let's continue. Objections to premise two. Objection number five. So premise two is nothing can be both potential and actual in the same property. If a log is potentially on fire, it is not actually on fire and vice versa. Objection five. This is the place that Aristotle's physics is really going to start to break down. How do we divide objects? If I take a very long, cold metal rod and heat it at one end, it is both hot at the heated end and potentially hot at the cold end at the same time. If we stopped heating it, the rod would actualize itself. The hot end would warm up the cold end, causing a problem for the next premise. How can we deal with this? Well, we might try to divide the rod into two separate objects, but then referring to a complex thing like humans as a single object seems 
impossible and concerning. We might say that the rod has parts and one part is hot and one part is cold, but in fact, there's a complete gradient all the way up and down the rod from very hot to very cold. And it's not that one part is hot and one part is cold, but every single molecule on that rod has a different amount of energy and so is a different level of heat. And so unless we divide it into its smallest parts, we can't say something like that. One might instead try to claim that the rod was in the process of changing from potentially hot to being actually hot. So the parts, some parts were hot and some parts were not. But this would be problematic if we were actively heating one end and actively cooling the other. The rod is not in the process of changing temperature. In fact, it's being preserved exactly at two different temperatures. So the claim that it is an act of changing doesn't make sense. So the idea that nothing can be both potential and actual in the same property is concerning and problematic. If something can be both actual and potential in the same property, it can in some way actualize itself, which breaks down the whole argument. Okay, so Mathema actually responded to this indirectly in another video. Um, uh, but the, the argument St. Thomas presents is that something cannot be actual and potential in the same respect. Yes, uh, a rod can be hot with respect to one end and cold with respect to another end, but it cannot be hot and cold in the same respect. Now, he says, oh, well, well there's an, a gradient, and so you can't uh, divide it like that. And, and to me, I mean, that doesn't, it doesn't really matter that there's a gradient. I mean, there's still part of the rod that's hot and part that's cold. Um, they are not hot and cold at the same time. Um, and in the same respect, because hot and cold are contraries. I mean, this would violate the principle of contradiction if they were hot and cold at the same time. Uh, people sort of do the same thing with the theory of evolution. Uh, Richard Dawkins basically makes this argument that, uh, well, it's it's just a really gradual change from uh, from like ape to humans, for example, and so you can't uh, determine the difference between them and and therefore there's not really a difference between apes and humans and I just want to say no that just doesn't follow at all just because it's basically it's just really hard to tell the difference between them just because there's a gradient doesn't mean there is no difference um, yeah yeah oh, I mean the existence yeah. of the gradient itself <laughs> I mean what yeah it's, it's that they don't as you're saying it's that they um they they aren't the same or they aren't different in the same respects you know they aren't actual and potential in the same respect um it's just kind of again yeah, i don't really get it because all we'd be saying is like well each of those spots like they don't have um or each of the spots on the rod so to speak you know they don't have contradicting tempers in the same place i don't, I don't see what's problematic with that statement yeah and like i said it just follows from the principle of non-contradiction and uh the law right. of the excluded middle uh, that you can't have something that is, you know, uh, basically uh, neither one nor the other, neither uh, mm -hmm. itself nor the contrary. That would violate the principle of uh, the excluded middle. Um, another thing, so he, he makes this really weird argument that like, oh, well, if you have it heating on one end and then it's cooling on the other end, then it's hot there's a gradient and it's not changing and like i don't understand at yeah, all I like follow that what what is his point like okay so you gave an example where something's not changing how is this relevant to the argument from change like i don't get it uh, yeah i i think maybe and this is just a guess because that was so confusing maybe what he's trying to go for is like well you know you're heating one end and you're heat and you're cooling the other such that the entire object is not changing but like I, I again i don't see what an objection that is <laughs> but i could be wrong i mean i i just don't even understand what he's going for yeah uh i mean he's feel free uh carnady's guy <laughs> if you want to respond and explain uh what you mean here because it's really not clear in my opinion Okay, let's uh, move on to the next part. Yeah. 
Looking at premise six, therefore objects cannot change themselves. They must be changed by some other actuality since potentiality must be changed by actuality and one thing cannot be both actual and potential. Beyond just cases like the one offered previously where objects change themselves, there are more complicated instances of objects changing themselves, as long as object is considered sufficiently large. Aristotle allows for living beings to change themselves in some sense because they have a soul that's driving them and that's the thing that's creating those actualities. But this premise runs into problems if non-living things can change themselves. Once again, Aristotle suffers from not having access to modern examples. There are plenty of machines which change themselves. A motion-sensing light changes itself from off to on. A self-driving car changes itself from being stopped to moving, even without a person. Though, they may still not be able to do that very well, etc. It seems there are plenty of things which move or change themselves. Something can go from potentiality to actuality without having something to intervene and cause it to do that. Okay, um, so e even in these examples, I think that what we would say is that, uh, yeah, um, things can change themselves if you're considering themselves as like a, a whole, um, but it's going to involve like, for example, the actuality of a part actualizing uh, another part that's potential with respect to it. And, and so this goes back to the, the point before about being actual and uh, potential in different respects. And so like, um, if we're saying, uh, you know, uh, motor, motor neuron causes the muscles to contract, the motor neuron was going to be actual with respect to the uh, electrical signal and the uh, muscle is going to be potential with respect to it and then it's going to be actualized by uh, the uh, the impulse of the motor neuron and so yeah there's really there's really no problem here and this like I said earlier this principle just comes from uh, the principle of non-contradiction, so I don't see how you're going to get around it. Yeah, I mean, Thomists don't deny the existence of... Is, is it imminent causality? Is that what it is in this case? Um, I mean, we have a whole category on this of, you know, cause... I guess you could call it, in a, in a sense, self-causation, whereas one uses one part to change another part of yourself. I mean, I, I don't really see what the problem is. Yeah, I, I think he's just misunderstanding um, the argument to, to mean right. that like holes can't move themselves by a part, which isn't what yes. the argument is. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what I'm saying is I'm not not quite seeing where he gets this as a contradiction <clears throat> or, or something that goes against our argument. But yeah, it's just kind of weird. Right. All right. Next one. Premise four, these other actualities must have themselves been previously been potentialities which were actualized by some other actuality. Objection number seven. For this argument to get going, we need to create a chain of motion. The chain needs to be essentially ordered, which means that Z is caused by Y, Y is caused by X, X is caused by W, etc. Or is actualized by, if you'd rather. One might imagine a set of gears, basically. They are all turning, but there must be one gear that is self-turning to start it all off. Because if all the gears were merely connected, they wouldn't be turning at all. And an important <coughs> thing with that gear metaphor is you couldn't have a circle of gears turning each other. If we assume that this gear model of an essentially ordered series is an accurate representation of the way that change actually works, we're inclined to accept the conclusion that there is some unmoved mover, some first gear that's turning the whole complex. The problem is not that when given such a model, the conclusion follows, but rather that such a model doesn't map onto our experience of the world. It is not that if given an essentially ordered series, we would not conclude that there must exist an unmoved mover, but rather that the world doesn't behave like an essentially ordered series. Let's take a look at why. 
Imagine a possible world where only two objects exist, a very hot metal bowl and very cold water inside that bowl. In the beginning, the water is actually cold but potentially warm. The bowl is actually hot but potentially cool. As time passes, the bowl becomes cool and the water becomes warm until they equalize. The water is changed by the bowl, but the only thing which changes the bowl is the water, since there is nothing else in this possible world. This is not an essentially ordered series since the two things change each other and are changed by nothing else. To say that this is like a chain of gears is just incorrect, since two gears can't move each other without a force. And yet, in this case, change does occur without anything else present. Another instance of this deals with... Okay, before it gets to that, uh, I, I have kind of a lot to say about this, so bear with me. Um, Let's go for it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I think he's thinking about this wrong because there are more than just two components here. There's more than just the bowl and the water. There's also heat. And we know that heat, as I was saying before, is distinct from the bowl and the water because they can change from hot to cold and remain a bowl and remain, a, and remain the water, respectively. Thus, it is heat which causes the bowl to be distinct from the cold bowl the hot bowl from the cold bowl. So St. Thomas Aquinas has an insight here that's useful. He says, it must be said that every being in any way existing is from God. For whatever is found in anything by participation must be caused in it by that which belongs to, which it belongs essentially as iron becomes ignited by fire. So let's, let's use a uh, wetness and water as an example. Let, let's say that water is essentially wet because it cannot be dry. Like it's part of what water is to be wet. And if it weren't was no longer wet, it would no longer be water. Now, if a ball changes from being dry to wet, we know it isn't essentially wet because otherwise it wouldn't be a ball when it's dry. So in itself, it is indifferent to wetness. So you need wetness to make the ball wet rather than dry. But this isn't all that we can say because technically the wetness we are talking about here is the particular wetness of the ball, which is an accident of the ball. The wetness of the water is, at least on the face of it, distinct. But think about it. You cannot have a wet ball without water. And the moment that the water dries up, the ball will no longer be wet. It doesn't even make sense to suggest that the ball could remain wet for one nanosecond w once the, the water dries up. Because the wetness of the ball is the wetness of the water. It simply is the wetness of the water as limited to the ball. The ball shares in or participates in the wetness of the water. So what I'm going to say is that... When we have a feature like heat or wetness that is in an object, non-essentially, it's going to be had by sharing in the activity of some being which has it essentially. So why why is this, though? Like, why is this always going to be the case? Well, we need to ask what makes the wetness of the b ball wet. And, of course, the answer, in a sense, is going to be its own nature. But that's not really completely correct because the wetness of the ball as the like the wetness specifically of the ball um, depends on the ball for its existence the moment the ball ceases to exist the wetness of the ball would have to cease to exist too at least as the wetness of the ball now note this doesn't mean that the ball causes itself to be wet in fact the ball cannot be what causes it to be wet because the ball in itself is indifferent to wetness, which is the entire reason we need wetness to differentiate it from being dry in the first place. So something else has to be cause, the cause of the wetness of the ball being wet. Now, since we know the water causes the ball to be wet, we can analyze the cause here. The ball is, cause, is the cause of the wetness of the ball being wet the wetness specifically of the ball because um, the sorry the ball is is what causes the wetness of the ball
being the wetness specifically of the ball. The water causes the wetness to be specifically wet. And so as soon as the ball ceases to exist, the wetness as wetness wouldn't disappear, but merely would be, be the wetness as the wetness of the ball. And I, I know that's a little confusing, but um, let's continue. So, so the principle here is that accidental qualities like wetness and heat, since they do not have their qualities insofar as they are accidental, i.e. In, insofar as they are wet, the wetness of the ball, they must have these qualities from something which has them essentially. So you don't merely have the wetness of the ball, you have the wetness of the water shared in by the ball. And it doesn't stop there. The water itself has potentialities, and so you have a regress until you get to something that has it essentially, and this is what we call God. Um, okay, I, I know that's long, but I briefly want to uh, mention another way of approaching this, which is the way that Norris Clark approaches this. He notes that something can be, something cannot be the same for the same reason it is different. So if you have two wet objects, let's say a cube and a ball, these two objects are the same in one sense and different in another. They cannot be different because they are the same and they cannot be the same because they are different. And so we need two different causes for their unity and difference. The cause of the unity is going to be the water, which is simply wet without these limits in itself. And the cause of the difference is going to be the cube and the ball respectively. And so this is an, another way of arguing that the causes of things had by participation is going to be found in something uh, which has this feature essentially. So all of that to say that no, the heated object uh, necessarily uh, requires a per se causal change or causal chain because heat isn't had essentially by the object. So yeah, that's a lot. Do you have any any other thoughts? No, I actually don't really have anything else to say. I think you covered it quite succinctly. Or, it was long, but I'd say you covered it much better than I could. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's kind of complicated, but... Um, Very much so, yeah. But, I mean, if you just think about... If you just think about the, the intuitive fact that you can't have a wet ball without water uh, making it wet. Um, yeah. It, it's pretty intuitive. And then all I'm doing here is just like explaining the reason why that's necessarily the case. Right. Anyway, so he gives another example. So let's continue and listen to what he says about this. Yep. With heavenly spheres, which Aristotle claimed could only be explained by an unmoved mover because they move consistently and they're always in a perfect motion and there's nothing else that's affecting them. The only way we can explain that movement and that change is through an unmoved mover of some kind. Imagine a possible world with nothing but a binary star, with two stars circling each other. They're held in perfect orbit around each other. The first keeps moving the second, while the second keeps moving the first. They cause change in each other, but do not require some external chain to cause them to change. There is no need for an unmoved mover. Okay, so uh, he's making the same mistake here. Um, mm -hmm. Because if you accept that motion is an actualization of potential, then a star is either potential with respect to being, being in location A, or it is actual with respect to being in location A. It can be either. So, And it will still be a star regardless of what location it's in. So being in a location A is distinct from its essence. It's outside of its essence. That's like there's a distinction between uh, be, between the location and what it is to be a star. And so you're going to, first of all, you're going to have to have uh, the location of 
A making it uh, the case, th like the property of the location of being, uh, the property of being in location A, which will distinguish it from not being in that location. And then you're going to need like whatever has that property essentially in order to uh, to actualize that limited case of that um, the limited to the star itself for the reasons that I laid out before. And so so yeah, he's just not thinking in terms of like a metaphysical causal chain. He's thinking more in terms of physical, and I think that's where he's getting confused. Yeah, I don't have anything else to say. That's, uh, that's a good way to put it. Okay. Uh, we'll move on to the next point then. Premise five, the chain of actualities cannot be infinite. Objection eight, even if we allow for the chain, which we cannot have loops of causation in the chain, that chain could either be infinite or have a starting place. The proponent of this argument might claim either that an infinite chain is impossible or that the more likely explanation is that it has a starting point. For the first, though it's difficult to imagine things which are infinite, we encounter them all the time. The solution of calculus to Zeno's paradox shows us that infinite chains can still allow for motion. And in fact, motion requires infinite sums. I may need to move an infinite number of distances to move anywhere, but that doesn't imply that I cannot move. What is to say that all movement doesn't rely on an infinite chain of actualities? In fact, other elements of movement, such as all of Zeno's paradox, seem to imply that movement requires infinite chains to happen. So why would this, this idea of actualities, be any different? In terms of the likelihood explanation, the claim that movement already requires an infinity, infinity of small movements in order to get any movement at all seems to justify it requiring other infinities be as good as any beyond as good as the assumption of there being an end to that chain. The burden of proof rests squarely on the shoulders of those that claim there is some stopping point. There should also be a burden of proof on someone that asserts forcefully that there's an infinite chain. I'm not saying that that is a done and sold conclusion. I'm saying that it's likely enough that I don't see a reason to completely deny that and 100% accept the idea that there's an end point to that chain. As a skeptic, we can suspend judgment here between a stopping point and an infinite regress, since there's no solid proof either way. Okay. Uh, so he might be surprised to find out that actually St. Thomas Aquinas didn't have a problem with infinities. Uh, I mean, he thought that God was infinite. Aristotle thought that the uh, that the universe was eternal, and so like they always assume that. Oh well, the problem is that they they're they're just assuming that there's like something really incomprehensible about infinities. Infinities are really hard for us to understand. Therefore, uh, you know, uh, therefore it's uh. It's it's not a, a coherent con concept, and that's not the argument. In fact, uh, so Saint Thomas pulls this uh, example of a, a purse, a hand pushing a stick, pushing a stone, which he actually gets from Aristotle in the Physics. Um, and th the point that he's making there is that since the the stick and the the stone do not have these motions essentially as part of their essence uh, they have to get it from something outside of them um, and an infinite series um, wouldn't have some so so the, the whole point is it has to drive it from something that has it essentially an infinite series wouldn't have this thing that has the uh, the actuality essentially and so the whole entire chain would be incoherent. It wouldn't, uh, it wouldn't have something which has uh, the actuality in itself. So it'd be like um, an example I like to, to give is if you are uh, saying, for example, that you have a thousand dollars and you say, okay, 
I have a thousand dollars. It's in the bank. You can go to the bank and, and get the thousand dollars. You go to the thousand dollars, and it's they say, oh yeah, he does have a thousand dollars, but it's not here. It's in another bank, and then says they tell you they go to the other bank. You go to the other bank. They say no, the thousand dollars not here. You have to get it inside of uh, another bank, and and suppose a series. You go to a bank after bank after bank, and you realize. There's this infinite series of banks that claims that there's uh, money in another bank, but none of the banks are going to have the money in it because this is an infinite series where each bank is supposed to, supposedly getting it from another. And so this, there's not going to be any money <laughs> because you have to have the money actually in something for it to exist. It, one of the banks would have to have have it in it and in that case the series would terminate inside of that uh, bank which has the money in it and so it's going to be similar with uh, with things that derive other forms of actuality from another um, do you have any comments on any of that bef before we continue yeah so I mean I, I don't have way too much to say beyond um, just kind of getting another example of this kind of um, the difficulty with having an infinite series um, that's ordered per se. One example I really like to give is with power. Um, so, I mean, like I'm using my laptop here and I mean, if I wanted power in theory, I could use, I mean, I could say, Hey, I'll grab an infinite number of extension cords, you know, but like until I have an actual power socket, that's not going to do anything. Um, and so, I, th I, th I think that this really does come more from a confusion as to how um, per se causal series works. And I think a lot of this as well, and I guess this is a, de a kind of a deficiency on the part of those of us who do support the first way or and per se causality is that sometimes we use some examples that may not be as, you know, the most conclusive. But I think one of the best examples has to do with existential causality you know when you when you get into the nature of existence and i have some books i could recommend on that um you really can't be positing a series of actual like a, a series of entities that are all necessarily existent in the same way um Valicella, bill Valicella, i think that's how you say his name categorizes this is what he calls the paradigm existent um so the existence of some um, entity, the paradigm existent is, is <coughs> such a different way, such a unique way that it's impossible for it to communicate that same exact existence, that same mode of being to a separate entity that is, you know, um, I, I guess you could say a different essence, um, such that it has the same mode of existence. It's, it's just really wonky to be saying that, oh yeah, you can have multiple of these kinds of actualities, especially in the case of existence. So, um, yeah, that's all I really have to say. Nothing crazy. Well, I also wanted to talk, mention the, uh, he, he talks about Zeno's paradox and that somehow calculus solves it. And like, I, I just wanted to say, so the reason, the reason why I, so I think, so yeah, you can plug in, um, maybe you can like s sort of, form a math equation where uh, something completes an infinite series, right? Um, but I mean, that's just math. Like that's not, that's not necessarily the real, real world. So I'm not sure that this is necessarily really solves the problem. And th so the problem, just to be clear, is that, um, so you're supposed to be moving um, step by step through an infinite series of, of parts, right? Um, and what does infinite series mean? So it means unending. And so uh, what you have here is an unending motion which ends. And that, that's, the, that's the, the contradiction inside of Zeno's paradox. And it, it, it doesn't really, I don't, I never really saw how you're supposed to like solve this with calculus like just because you can uh you know form a uh just because you can form um form a calc uh, like an equation that shows 
an infinite series doesn't mean that it's actually possible in reality to complete an endless process of change. Um, also, um, some, so the way that Aristotle solves this is he says that actually things are not divided into an infinite number of parts. So there's not an actual infinity there. So you're not actually moving across uh, an infinite number of parts. Um, it's potentially infinitely divisible, but actually it's just one continuous object. And so you're just moving um, across uh, one space rather than a space which is, uh, rather than an infinite series of spaces. And so I would say that this is the actual way of answering the question, which, um, uh, yeah, but uh, it's really uh, it's really irrelevant to the argument for motion. I would say uh, the the whole infinite series, it, it's like directly, directly, it's not relevant. You could make arguments regarding it, but anyway. Yeah. Uh, one thing I'll add is that. Yeah, Loke does a really, you know, I think his name is Andrew Loke. Is that how you say his name? Um, you know, he's a he's a professor. He he's done some work on Kalam, and I'm not necessarily somebody that absolutely loves Kalam, but he had a good section in his book on Kalam where he talks about a distinction between concrete and abstract infinities, and basically argues, yeah, you can have abstract infinites, which is what mathematically you, you'd have in math, but you can't have a concrete infinity, which is what you'd have here in the world. So again, I really don't. Just as you were saying, I don't see how calculus would solve Zeno's paradox. Yeah, and and again, just to be clear, we're not we're not saying infinites are impossible. Um, we're just talking about specific types of infinites that would be impossible. Right. All right. Let's continue then. Nine. This is an objection to the conclusion. Therefore, there must be some pure actuality, some unmoved mover, which is itself the cause of all motion, but is not moved itself. That unmoved mover is God. Setting aside the concern that even if the unmoved mover can be proven, it's not the God of the Bible, and all the other objections listed so far, this argument doesn't show that that mover is unique. Imagine that by unmoved mover, we mean a force of nature, such as gravity. Now, this might make some amount of sense, and it might actually counter some of our other arguments. If by unmoved mover we really mean gravity, maybe that would make sense of how in a world where the only things that exist are two binary stars, they wouldn't circle each other if gravity wasn't there as a force. And so maybe that force is really what this argument is getting at, that what Aquinas has actually proved and what Aristotle's actually proved is just the forces of nature that cause everything to change and move. They sound like a much better fit than God, first off. But setting that aside, such a force seems like the much more correct conclusion to this argument, at least if you believe in science, change, and causation. Physical forces cause all motion. Without them, even the bowl of water and the binary star would not move or change. However, that doesn't imply that there's only one force of nature despite all of the works of physics to try to bring the micro-level interactions of physics in line with the macro-level interactions. We have yet to come up with some theory of everything of physics, which explains both macro and micro-level interactions. The point is that even if this argument is successful in showing that there is at least one pure actuality, like gravity, it doesn't mean that such an actuality is unique and that there is only one. We may never com come up with a grand unifying theory or a theory of everything with combining the grand unifying theory of all of the weak nuclear force and the strong nuclear force and electromagnetism with gravity. If that never happens, and this is a better explanation of this causal chain, it seems the causal chain shows that there's multiple movers. And going back to the gear metaphor, you could have a giant chain of gears and you could have two gears turning them. Okay. Yeah, there's so many problems with that. <laughs> oh, go ahead. Yeah, I was just gonna say there are a lot of problems. I think the first one is, okay, so if you're gonna talk about like multiple pure actualities, what what's the distinction between the two of them, right? If there's a distinction, then one stands in potency to the the other in, in some respect. I mean, <clears throat> unless you're going to uphold 
a like a Scotian theory of Hecaides or however you pronounce it. Um, you can't do that. And even within the Scotus theory, when you get to pure actuality, you need infinity. You know, the pure actual must be infinite. And according to Scotus, with infinites, they're necessarily the same in essence, but not necessarily in term. And so I don't see and I in you know, in a different way than, than the finite universe in particular. So I just don't see how he can substantiate this idea that you can have multiple pure actualities. That's just, what? <laughs> like, Right, and yeah, I was going to approach it from a slightly different angle, but basically the same thing, um, which is uh, that wholes depend on their parts. And so um, the pure actual actuality would have to... Um, be uh sorry it couldn't be composed of parts so things like gravity which um is going to be composed of parts because it's multiple are not going to be possible they, they couldn't be um the pure actual actualizer or any other material thing for that matter and uh to his credit he does mention that saint thomas has other arguments inside of uh the summa um at, but just to be clear, St. Thomas does address uh, material uh, realities being purely actual and, you know, completely shows that that's not possible. Right. Um, another thing is, so even if we were to say that, like, part of the universe uh, were this purely actual actualizer, I mean, that would just be a form of pantheism, I would say. Right. Um, so it wouldn't necessarily show that that God doesn't exist, or it wouldn't be an alternative answer to God technically. Um, I mean, a, a lot of atheists will object that, oh, well, it, it's not necessarily intelligent, and intelligence is necessary to the idea of God. But I mean, Spinoza, for example, believed in God, but he didn't believe um, God was intelligent. And uh, this is because classically the definition of God and which uh, has been that basically God has everything that he has within himself, that God is pure act. He is his own act of existence. Um, so, yeah, it, it's, uh, I, I don't think, I think, I don't think this is a good objection, even if we accept, if we ignore the uh, divine simplicity part. All right. Uh, so this is, we're almost at the end. Uh, I think he just brings, kind of summarizes things. So let's go ahead and go through that. Sure. As noted at the beginning of this video, despite the objection to this argument, it was very powerful for the time. Modern Thomas may attempt to defend it by drawing comparisons to modern physics, rejecting modern physics, and asserting Aristotle's original version. Either way, the most convincing objection to this argument, in my opinion, is that it relies too much on an outdated model for the ways that things interact and change. We have a plethora of reasons for rejecting these old models and therefore rejecting the foundation of this argument. And I think, as I said with those first two objections, the other objection that's the most convincing to me after that one is that barring future arguments, which as I have seen are far worse than this, I see no reason to not just say, wow, that sounds a lot like gravity. That sounds a lot like electromagnetism. Hmm, something that causes all change, that can perfectly predict everything that's going to happen in the world and without which things wouldn't change? That sounds like a physical force of nature, not a conscious being. But that's more an abductive argument in terms of what is which of these situations explains it better than a perfect argument for this has to be what you're talking about. But the burden of proof is on the presenter of showing that this amorphous thing definitely isn't gravity, and it definitely is a conscious god of the Bible. I don't think that's been shown, but that's not what we're talking about necessarily here. So it's important to understand what the goals of this argument are and what they are not. Whew. All right. All right, so... I think we can stop it there. Um, I mean, yeah, it's just, uh, so, I mean, like, like he mentioned, uh, there are other arguments. Uh, there's arguments for divine simplicity, uh, which would rule out material things and also gravity, which is technically also a material thing, but we don't have to get into that. 
Um, also, it, it would roll out. Um, oh, you 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 can also show that God is intelligent. I have a um, a video series called Proving Christianity, where I my latest video in that series is proving that God is omniscient, um, starting with this idea of God as purely actual or existence itself. Um, and so, yeah, you, you can make these arguments. And, I mean, it would be interesting to see if he, he says he thinks that they're not any better or maybe he thinks they're even worse than the first way. It'd be interesting to see what his objections would be to those arguments. Yeah, I'd be curious to see that too. Um, but yeah, I don't have anything else to say on the video. I just don't think his objections worked, but at least I'm glad he interacted with the material to some extent. Yeah, that's true. Um, I mean, a lot of people will just um, completely uh, ignore what the St. Thomas actually says and then like say that this is like the Kalam ar co cosmological argument and just address the Kalam cosmological argument instead. We can be started on those people, man. <laughs> yep. All right. Uh, well, thanks guys for coming. Um, I might have like a discussion later on spaces on Twitter if anybody wants to talk about the first way. I think that would be an interesting thing to do next. So. So if you're watching this live, uh, go ahead and join me on Twitter and you can discuss this, ask questions about the first way. And uh, if not, thanks for watching and I'll see you guys next time. Yeah, thanks guys. Have a good one.